morning and welcome to this morning's online service. Today, Pete is giving us today's talk and he is looking in particular at the name which we find in Genesis, Elroy. Now, literally translated, the name Elroy means the God who sees me. And it's this name which I have found particularly comforting. It's a name which tells us that the God that we worship is not some distant, far off, hard hearted God, but a God who draws close, who looks at the individual, at each of us, and truly sees his beloved child. It is a God who, in the midst of whatever situation you're going through, is a God that is constantly there, a companion, a comforter and a guide. And I think that that particular name, that particular aspect of God is an aspect which so many of us around the world are in desperate need for right now. You might be feeling during lockdown that you are on your own, that you are struggling, that you are full of anxiety. And you just need to know in the moment that the God of Elroy, the God who, yes, is the God who created the heavens, is also the God who truly sees and knows you. And we've had some horrendous news in the news this week. And I think that it's only right that we begin with a time of prayer for those people that are suffering so much right now. So let's pray. God, who is the God of Elroy, God, who is our refuge, hear our prayer. As we hold the people of Beirut in our hearts at this time, fill us with compassion and move us to reach out in love. In your mercy, bring comfort to those who mourn, healing to those who are injured, shelter to those who are homeless sustenance to those who hunger. Give strength to those who are working to rebuild shattered lives and protect those who are vulnerable, especially in a time of coronavirus. Lead us in your ways so that together we may bring the light of new hope wherever there is destruction and despair. We pray for your healing spirit to be present. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
eternity Weep no more and sing for joy Our reading for today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 16, and I'm beginning to read from verse 1. Hagar and Ishmael. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. 
The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahay Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Well, there I was leading a small team of walkers along a high mountain ridge that was narrow to say the least. A knife edge was a more appropriate description of our path. Looking ahead, I could see another mile or so of this difficult terrain to go. To my left and right were very steep slopes, with the sea far off in the distance to my left, and a mist-filled valley to my right with a low sun on my back. So imagine my shock when I looked down at the shadows cast by the team in the valley below. There were the normal shadows of the team, but mine had a rainbow-coloured halo around my head. When I jumped up and down and waved my arms around, my shadow did the same. My team were just a little bit concerned and thought that I'd succumbed to some form of mountain sickness. I hadn't been a Christian for long at the time, and the sight reminded me of some very early church painting, which showed the saints with halos around their heads. Perhaps I'd become a modern-day Saint Peter, or did God have his beady eye on me? One disappointment was that the team couldn't see my halo, but they could see their own personal ones. Perhaps they'd all been canonised. It was only after getting home and checking out the internet that I fully realised that I was still plain old Peter and not Saint Peter. What I had seen was an example of a phenomenon known as the Brocken Spectre where a person's head is often surrounded by rings of coloured light to form a halo, which appears opposite the sun's direction when water droplets in the mist refract and backscatter sunlight. Now I mention this true story as we have just started a mini sermon series on some of the names of God. Jared kicked off last week with God the All-Powerful Creator God, and the name of God that I've been given today is El Roy E, the God who sees me. In our reading today, Abraham once again shows that though he is the father of faith, he still makes mistakes and has doubts. We will see Abraham trying to rush God's plan. God had promised Abraham land and a family, and so far Abraham had received neither. So in Genesis 16, Abram tries to provide a family for himself, rather than trust and wait on God. It's never a good idea to try to accomplish God's plan in your own way and in your own timing. God's plans come complete with his methods and his timing. And when we try to tinker with that, it messes everything up. Here, a failure in faith leads to a brazen attempt to provide by human means what the Lord is accused of withholding. If we look at the times that God has promised the son to Abraham, there is one thing absent from all of these promises. Though God had promised Abraham a son, God had never included Sarai in that promise. God never said that Abraham would have a son through Sarai, only that Abraham would have a son. Our opening verses say, 
Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Sometimes God doesn't give us all the information we think we need to follow him. Sometimes he only tells us what he's going to do, not how he's going to do it. Abraham and Sarai find themselves in such a situation. And Sarai, realising that she is barren, comes up with an alternative way to carry out God's plan. God had promised Abraham a son. Sarai knew just how much this meant to her husband and knew that Abraham was beginning to wonder if God would keep his promise. And so it dawned to her one day that maybe the son could come through someone else. Maybe the problem was her. So she looked around at the surrounding people of Canaan and saw what they did. In those days, the men of the household would often sleep with not only their wives, but also with the female servants of their households. If children were born to these servants, most often these children became servants as well. But once in a while, especially if a boy was born to the servant, the head of the household would adopt the servant boy and make him his own son. And this is apparently what Sarai has in mind. In these opening verses of this chapter, Sarai comes up with a plan for how they can accomplish God's will and goes to tell Abram about it. And Abram follows her lead. Sounds familiar? Think back to the Garden of Eden. Eve is deceived by the serpent into thinking that God is holding back something from them. God has something more for you, it says, but God isn't giving it to you right now. So just take it. So she goes to her husband and presents her plan to him, and they both eat the fruit. Our reading continues. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So at first, things seemed to work out just fine. Everything went according to plan. Hagar conceived just as Sarai wanted. But as with all sin, there were unexpected negative consequences. Hagar began to despise Sarai. Since she had conceived, she considered herself better than Sarai. Aside from the mental turmoil Sarai went through of having her husband sleep with another woman, she now must deal with the emotional anguish of feeling cursed by God and being despised by a servant. Her plan had worked, but not quite as Sarai had imagined. But that's the way sin is. It makes great promises, but never tells you about the drawbacks. Another negative consequence of Abraham's and Sarai's sin is the marital strife that came about. Then Sarai said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. In effect, Sarai is saying to Abraham, why did you listen to me? You should have known better to go and sleep with that woman. Now look what's happened. And you know, she is right, kind of. Abraham should have known better. He is the one who was always talking with God. He knew what was right and what was wrong. He knew deep down that God had intended the son to come not only through him, but also through his wife, Sarai. So when Sarai says, you are responsible to Abraham, she is right. Though she implanted the idea in his mind, it was he who sinned and he should have known better. Abraham cannot blame Sarai, even as Adam tried to blame Eve. But Abraham is a wily character and in verse 6 he scoots away from his responsibility and makes another mistake when he says, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. Hagar had a son because of Abraham's fault, Abraham's mistake, Abraham's sin. 
Abraham should have been the one to deal with Hagar. He should have been the one to provide for her and protect her. Surely the role of any good father. But Abraham does none of this. And it's just like us when we sin. We always want to ignore the sin and avoid the consequences and never assume responsibility for our actions. We like to sweep the sin under the rug and let those we have hurt suffer for our neglect. We don't know how far Sarai went in her abuse, but it was so bad Hagar had to run away. Abraham should have seen how bad the abuse was getting and intervened. But again, he was trying to avoid the consequences of his sin and he allowed a woman to be abused because of it. But God, the righteous and just judge, always sees the plight of the abused and the forsaken. And though Abraham has not provided for Hagar, God does. We read in verse 7 that the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shua. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Now the angel knows where Hagar is going and where she has come from. He asks her because he wants to see if she knows and if she will be honest. He also wants to provide direction to her. But note that he calls her by name. And this is significant because up until this point in chapter 16, Nobody has spoken to her or about her by name. Sarai in verses 2 and 5 say, my maid. Abraham then does the same thing in verse 6. He says to Sarai, your maid. But when the angel of the Lord speaks to, the Lord, to her, he says, Hagar. Abraham and Sarai think of Hagar as a slave, a foreigner, a possession, someone to be used and abused and mistreated and neglected. But God looks upon her as a person. He knows her name. He speaks to her gently. Abraham and Sarai may have looked upon her as expendable and an expedient way to have children. But God sees her differently. He knows her true needs. He cares for her as a person. And when others may ignore you and mistreat you and abuse you, never forget that God sees and he knows and he cares. He wants to show Hagar that he cares for her. And so he asks her the questions to which Hagar answers, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. Notice that she only answers one of the questions and even then not very well. The angel of the Lord has already indicated that he knows Hagar is Sarai's maid and that Hagar has run away from her. And Hagar doesn't really provide any new information. She's vague about why she's fleeing and where she's fleeing to. Maybe she feels guilty about what she's doing. Even back then, it was not right to run away from your master. However, the angel or Lord doesn't rebuke her, but just gently corrects her and tells her what to do by saying, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And this is not the advice that Hagar wanted to hear. The last thing she wanted to do was to go back and submit herself to such treatment. But this is what God is telling her to do. Can you hear her objections? But it's not fair. Or perhaps, but I'll be mistreated. Or even, you don't understand how difficult it will be. Well, it's not about understanding. It's about doing what is right. But you know, God does understand. And when we do the right thing, even when it's extremely hard, God sees, God notices, and he blesses. In verses 10 to 12, the angel of the Lord says to Hagar that she will be blessed. The angel says that I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. From Hagar, will come a multitude of descendants. This is very similar to the promise God had given to Abraham in Genesis 15. But whereas Abraham's descendants throughout Sarai will bring blessing to the world, Hagar's will bring strife. Because the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. 
His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. We are told what sort of man Ishmael will be and what his descendants will be like as well. He will experience great affliction at the hand of others and will cause great affliction as well himself. But nevertheless, Hagar responds to God. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. <clears throat> you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. She's been mistreated and abused. But she recognises that God does see all. Do you know that God sees you? It's one thing to know he loves you and that he hears your prayers. But it's quite another to know that his eyes are upon you. He is watching you. Some years ago, I was diving in the lovely warm blue sea of the Caribbean when alongside me <coughs> came this barracuda, all eye and teeth. And he followed me for about five minutes and then disappeared. For the rest of the dive, I kept looking around me. I was very conscious of that beady eye, the vicious teeth and the reputation of this underwater killer. But back to scripture. I don't mean to say that God is spying on you to punish you when you fail. No, the concept of God seeing us is a loving one. He watches us because he's concerned about us and loves to see us. Just like parents love to watch their children sleep and play, God loves to watch us. It gives him joy to see us go through life and learn about him and interact with other people. And he also watches to protect us from harm. So if something does start to go wrong, he can immediately be there to help us through it. God sees you. God watches you. Why? Because God loves you. Hagar, knowing this, returned to Abram and Sarai, where she had a son. It even appears Abram might have stepped up to the plate and taken some of the responsibility for his actions. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. <clears throat> Notice that Sarai is no longer mentioned here. Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham named him Ishmael just as God had told Hagar. Certainly there was going to be further strife and problems because of Hagar and Ishmael, but for now Abraham appears to have understood that these problems were his fault. <coughs> and he needed to do what was right for Hagar and Ishmael. He made a mistake because he tried to get ahead of God. But now that the mistake is made, Abraham owns up to it and trusts God for the future. The Bible indicates that Abraham was 75 years old when he first received God's promise of a son. And so it has now been 11 years waiting for this promise. God sometimes moves slowly and he will always allow us to outrun him if we want to. But when we do, we inevitably make a wrong turn and find ourselves in a dead end. Then God has to come in and lead us back to the right road and continue on from there. Running ahead of God never speeds things up. It only slows things down and causes great heartache and headache later. So what are we to learn from this passage? Let me close with a few thoughts. God-fearing people sometimes try to fulfill God's will in their own ways and complicate matters. But God can even exist within their own mistakes and use them to work out his plans. God-fearing people like Abraham and Sarah can still be at a place where they give in to jealousy and cruelty, anger and responsibility, pride of class, position and status. None of this is whitewashed in scripture. It's all there in black and white. God calls us not to go our own way, but to go his way, even if it means hardship and suffering. We're not called to pleasure, but to the will of God. He calls us to obey even when it's hard. So rest assured that when our Bible says that God sees you, 
It is not the beady, greedy, voracious eye of the Barracuda, but God's fully personal eye, full of grace, full of promise, full of love for us. And just like the Brock Inspector, we need to be patient to witness what he has in store for us. But God is with you all the time. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death
the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near You are near Today Ian is going to lead us in our prayers but as many of you know whilst the church building has been shut a lot of work has been done to fix and remedy the west wall and Ian thought it would be a great idea to be able to give you a bit of a snapshot image and also lead us in some reflections that he has been having as he's been working in the project. So we're going to hand over to Ian and we're going to learn a little bit more about the church before he takes us into press. Hello there this is uh, Ian uh, thinking about prayers for this Sunday. Uh, I'm in church at the moment obviously staying two meters apart from everybody because I'm the only person here. You can see the church is getting some tender loving care whilst it's empty. The west wall is being refurbished and replastered and uh, whilst I've been working on that project I've been having uh, one or two reflections about my own personal lockdown and what the time has meant for the church as well. Whilst uh, we have been out of uh, the church, uh, the West Wall has had a good uh, examination and uh, the old plaster has been removed. And what you see here is the, the first scratch coat of plaster going back on. And there's two more coats to go uh, to bring it to a finish and back to its former glory. During that process, of course, we have the opportunity to have a, a real close-up look uh, at the, the window and the workmanship of people in the past. In the process, we can see some details of the west window which aren't normally seen from the ground. Little bits of workmanship which are getting a touch-up as we refurbish the window. Some bits are in a better state of repair than others, as you can imagine. But this will be an opportunity uh, to do some repairs as required. It's not often you get this close up to the west wall. And as you climb higher into the window, you can see all the workmanship that has gone on to put it together uh, to put the leaded lights in, which probably from the ground we take for granted. And it made me think our life's a little bit like that. When we look closely at the way we're made and the way God has put us together, it is quite remarkable. But a lot of the time we take it for granted. And I wonder whether lockdown has given you the opportunity for some reflection uh, to get back close to our Creator, to give thanks for the way that we've been made, for the details that we perhaps take for granted. And when we've been forced to slow down, I wonder whether we've also been forced to remember how good God is and the reasons, many reasons we have uh, to thank Him and praise him. And I pray as this uh, bit of the building is restored during this lockdown period, uh, we too will find ourselves restored and reconnected with our Creator and given a bit of an overhaul if that's, uh, if that's necessary or possible and come back refreshed uh, into fellowship uh, with each other in the building when that happens. So, uh, I should be leading prayer shortly, but uh, I thought I'd give this insight as to what's going on in the building before I do. God bless. Bye-bye now. Let us pray. Thank you, God, that while so many church buildings remain shut during this period of lockdown, you continue to look after your church, the people of God. And in these uncertain days, the good news of the gospel is still being spread by word and deed throughout our town, our country, and the whole world. 
we do not lose heart, nor are we anxious about the things going on in the world, when we remember the love you have for your creation, shown to us in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And we invite you once again to be the Lord of our lives, and by the work of your indwelling Holy Spirit, to renew us and make us fit for your service. We cannot escape from your presence. We know that nothing is hidden from your gaze. You know all about us and yet still love us. So we invite you into the hidden places of our lives and ask that you would transform us day by day, more and more into the likeness of your son. You are the potter and we are the clay. We are your handiwork. Equip us with the gifts and fruits of your spirit so you can fulfill your purpose in our lives. Please help those who are searching for you to find you today. Help those who are weary to renew their strength and faith in you today. Heal the sick. Comfort those who mourn. Restore the brokenhearted. Rescue those in trouble. Draw near to those who feel far away from you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say
So that's it for this service. I hope that you have a great week. Take care and stay safe.